Hi everyone, Kevin here back with video number two. We're looking at sugars in grapes. When we talk about sugar in wine, we need to talk about the conjugation of many molecules in wine to sugar, especially aroma molecules, but also phenolics and other compounds as well. And this is really similar in the first bullet point to compounds that are conjugated to cysteine. Remember, we had the example of the aroma molecule that is covalently bound to cysteine or cis, the abbreviation for the amino acid cysteine. So when the aroma molecule is bound to cysteine, the entire molecule we do not detect. But when yeast, in our nose that is, when yeast break this bond to cysteine, now yeast liberate that aroma compound and now we smell that in a wine. Similar to conjugation to cysteine, lots of things are conjugated to sugars. Typically it's glucose, but it can be a polysaccharide and it can be sugars other than glucose as well. We have three terms that we use when we're talking about these conjugated um, molecules conjugate, conjugated to sugars. The A-glycone is the free aroma molecule or free molecule. Usually we're talking about aroma molecules when we talk about conjugation, but not always. The glycone is the sugar to which the A-glycone is conjugated. So that could be glucose, it could be a disaccharide, it could be galactose or another sugar the pentose in some cases, uh, five carbon sugar that is, where glucose and galactose are six carbon sugars. And then the glycoside is the combined A-glycone with the sugar. So the, glyco the glycoside is usually what we re would refer to in grapes, where in wine oftentimes the glycoside still exists, but we have uh, a significant amount of A-glycones that are separated from their conjugated sugar. Okay, so that is why we need to talk more about sugars. They're often conjugated to things in wine. So let's talk a little bit about carbohydrate basics. We're gonna talk some more chemistry of carbohydrates. So let's do basics first. So carbohydrates, of course, are hydrated carbon. For every carbon, typically there is one water. So in glucose, for example, there are six carbons and six waters. So the formula is C6H12O6. Now, there are a whole bunch of six carbon sugars, and we call those aldohexoses if they have an aldehyde group. They'd be ketohexoses if they had a ketone group. But in the case of glucose, it's an aldohexose. It has an aldehyde group and six carbons. And there are a whole bunch of other carbons that also contain, uh, other sugars rather, that contain six carbons. These are epimers of one another. So epimer is a term used in the carbohydrate world to designate sugars that differ by the position of the hydroxyl group. So you'll see that compare galactose and glucose, for example, the positions of the hydroxyl groups are different. Now you can't just rotate around bonds to change the position of the hydroxyl groups because remember, these carbons are sp3 hydro hy hybridized, that is at least these five carbons that I'm circling here are sp3 hybridized. And so there's tetrahedral geometry around these carbons. And so it's not as simple as rotating around one of these single bonds to change the position of an OH group, for example, like I'm circling here in galactose. We actually have to break bonds and change positions. And again, that's because the Fisher representation makes it look like it's they're sim simple 90 degree angles, bond angles, but they're not, of course, this is tetrahedral geometry. So if you wanna see that more readily, put together a model of one of these aldohexoses and uh, check it out and you'll see that you've gotta break bonds to change epimers. All right, so positions of OH groups determine the name of the aldohexose and each of these has different properties uh, because of the different positioning of the hydroxyl groups. 
There are four chiral centers in each aldohexose, and remember a chiral carbon is one that has four different groups attached to it. So in galactose here, I'm circling the four chiral carbons. And so we need to name the stereochemistry of these stereocenters, and we could use the modern RS system. If you do, however, you get fairly complicated results like is shown here. This is glucose. So we could name each of the stereocenters 2, 3, 4, and 5, but it makes it fairly complicated. Carbohydrate chemists use a simpler system, which is in many ways outdated, but it works and it's a nice shorthand. And that's the D and L configuration. This was developed by Fisher, who did the Fisher projections. And basically, uh, we use it for carbohydrates and amino acids, both. D and L are defined by the position of the OH group on the highest number chiral carbon. So in the case of glucose here, we have four chiral carbons and we're numbering from the highest priority group, which would be the aldehyde. So this is carbon one at the top and carbon six at the bottom. So carbon five is the highest numbered chiral carbon. And so we look at the position of the OH group on number five. If the OH group is on the right, that is defined as D glucose. Fisher originally did these definitions in glyceraldehyde, the three carbon carbohydrate, the smallest carbohydrate. Uh, but we use the same conventions in uh, carbohydrates with higher numbers of carbons. We also use these, as I mentioned, this DNL system in amino acids. So if the OH group is on the right, it's D glucose. If it's on the left, it's L glucose. These are mirror images of one another, right? So if we had a mirror plane down the middle, we, these are mirror images of one another, but they're not superimposable upon one another. And again, because of that tetrahedral geometry, they're not superimposable. If you want to see that better, make models of both, and you'll see that they're not superimposable, even though they are mirror images. So they are enantiomers of one another. Most forms we find in biological systems are D glucose, and nature has evolved to use D and not L. D will fit in the active site, it, or if D fits in the active site of an enzyme, L likely will not because of the different configuration of the, of the molecule. Enzyme active sites we'll talk more about, but they carefully uh, fit substrate molecules that is the substrate of the enzymatic reaction. Those substrates will fit tightly in an active site. And if there's different stereochemistry at one of the chiral carbons, as is the case here, the alternate stereochemistry typically will not fit in the enzyme active site. So nature's evolved to use D and not L configurations for the most part. I mentioned here, you can't quite see that little box behind the video, uh, the video of me, but you'll see this is not a chiral carbon. And I, I just mentioned that as by way of reminder, again, a little review, there are two hydrogens, two of the groups on this carbon six are hydrogens, and therefore it's not a chiral carbon. All right, so just a quick summary. The position of the OH groups determines, in the case of aldohexose, is six carbon sugars, or in the case of five carbon sugars, if we were comparing those, or four. It's a position of the OH group that determines the name of the molecule, and those molecules are different. Once we get the name of the molecule, then D and L shows us the stereochemistry of that particular molecule. Okay, so D, D if the OH is on the right in the Fisher proje projection of the highest chiral carbon, and L if it's on the left. That's it for video number two in this topic. We'll pick up more review of carbohydrate chemistry in video three. Thanks for watching and see you then.